Hey Wine Snobs, welcome to another edition of Wine Snob TV off the beaten path. Recently I took a trip up to Seattle and I uh, wanted to make sure that I capture the experience while it's still fresh in my memory. Um, you know, I've been to Seattle a couple times, the Seattle area, um, actually quite a few times, but I've never actually explored the wine country out there. And I was very well aware um, of that there was a very vibrant and thriving wine country out there. Obviously, I've tasted and reviewed many wines from the region at large, but I'd never really taken the time to explore, um, you know, to go wine tasting in that area. Um, oftentimes, a lot of the wines that get exported outside of a certain region, while they may be representative, um, you still miss a very key part of the vibrant winemaking ecosystem for that specific region. Um, there's a lot of nuance and detail that you miss um, that you don't get until you actually, you know, uh, get boots on the ground, so to speak. Um, so I made it a point a couple weeks ago while I was in Seattle to actually get out and explore. Um, and just sort of wander around. Um, the specific region in question is Woodinville. You've probably heard of it, Woodinville. Um, is this sort of a little commune area? Uh, you have lots of little artisan wineries and they're making wines everywhere from Yakima Valley, Columbia Valley, um, Red Mountain and everything else in between. Um, it's, it's really vibrant, it's very nice and almost has a bit of a small, quaint, small town, um, quaint feel to it. Uh, so it was very nice. Um, I liked it, I had a lot of fun. So I'm just gonna go over tonight. There are many amazing wineries out there tonight. We're just gonna go through the wineries that I happened to stumble in and, I, and what I thought of them and they were all great. Um, I, I couldn't, I, I couldn't have been happier um, as a wine snob. Um, so yeah, uh, it started with a Saturday morning and uh, I was literally first through the door, or at least one of the first through the doors at uh, Novelty Hill Genuic Winery. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, this was a very interesting um, winery. You know, what caught me about it was, first of all, the architecture. Uh, it was very modern, industrial, um, just right up my alley as far as styling goes. Um, and even though I'm a little apprehensive when I see um, very well done wineries, I, I wonder sometimes if perhaps maybe they've, they're not focusing enough on the wines, but I have to say, I'm happy to report that um, this winery definitely had it in spades. Great wines, very well executed. Um, you know, very clean, crisp, well-built, you know, subtle wines. One of the things you'll notice in this region, you know, as I'm starting off this list here, is subtlety, especially if you're coming from an, an area such as myself, California, where wines tend to express themselves, you know, very, very bold, you know, no matter what region you go. I mean, unless you're coming from, say, Santa Barbara, a large central coast, um, you know, you miss a lot of nuance, um, you know, when you're tasting California wines, they tend to have a very bold expression, even when it comes to say Pinot. But I have to say, one thing you're going to find, in, you know, across the board is you're going to find a lot of subtlety and a lot of nuance. Wines are going to be perhaps maybe a little lower alcohol, you know, a little less tannic, um, a little less fruit. Um, a little drier and and just overall a little more delicate um, and I like that personally it gives me time to understand it allows me to better appreciate the craft uh, the winemakers craft so to speak but yeah um, Novelty Hill Genuic Winery um, was a great one I highly recommend it um, lovely folks they were really nice enough to accommodate me um, at a moment's notice without reservations or appointments. Uh, so that was really nice. Thank you guys, I appreciate it. Um, I was constrained by how much <laughs> wine I could put in my carry-on, 
my single carry-on bag. So I had to really discipline myself to pick just one bottle. And I have to say, of the whole lineup at Novelty Hill, Genuic, I, um, I, I liked everything. Um, I, I wanted to take one of everything home, including the case of rosé special they had going on. <laughs> um, but I settled on Il Corvo, which was from the Columbia Valley. Um, so if you go out there, I'd love to hear what you think about uh, the Il Corvo. And uh, definitely comment below, let me know what you think, what you liked the most of uh, from this winery. Um, I would love to know. I'm going to be reviewing that wine. Um, so definitely come back, check the feeds, jump on Instagram or on the blog and, uh, and keep in touch, stay in contact that way. The second one after Novelty Hill Genuic um, was Delil. I believe, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, Delil Cellars. Um, that was quite an experience. It's a little bigger uh, operation, uh, so is Novelty Hill, but not as, but, um, but still very nicely put together. Lovely architecture, award-winning architecture, um, and the staff were just impeccable. Um, I was unable to do a walk-in because they're obviously very busy. Um, it was during the weekend, of course. Um, but I did get an appointment uh, the following day and came back to follow up with them and um, it was fantastic. Uh, loved their wines, loved the ambiance, um, and uh, their highly um, focused tastings. I found them to be right up my alley. You know, you get a lot of quiet space um, and a lot of material to guide you through the tasting uh, to understand the wines and better appreciate them. Um, they were kind enough. This was one of uh, the few where I actually uh, shipped probably about uh, at least a couple bottles back. I just opted to ship um, because they had uh, at the moment they you know they offered something like one cent shipping. So um, <laughs> I couldn't resist. I picked three bottles out of uh, those. It was the Minuit, the Four Flags, and the Chaleur. So there's a French theme going on here, mostly Rome varietals. Um, great wines, very well executed, especially for their scale of their operation. I found that um, impressive. Uh, typically at that scale, um, you tend to uh, compromise a little bit on the nuance, but I have to say that the little wines were really nice. They were very, very well put together and I think worth it. The tasting, um, definitely um, worth checking out, uh, especially if you're exploring that region, you want to just have a general understanding for the wines. I think I found them to be very representative and uh, the focus tastings made for um, a good study of that general region at large and all the sub regions there. Um, so definitely check it out. Let me know in the comments uh, what you think as well and what, what your favorites were. Um, following that, um, I hop down. There's, there's a little, there's a little con commune or kind of like a co-op um, just down the street in Woodenville there where you have many little boutique wineries. Um, too many to explore in one day. If you're coming out here, I recommend spending, you know, at least a couple days. That's what it's going to take if you're going to do any meaningful tasting. If you're just kind of running through the gamut, um, you might be able to squeeze it into a day or two, but it's going to take several days. So I kind of uh, ended up going with wherever, um, whoever could accommodate me um, on the spot, uh, just because it was a last minute trip and uh, with last minute, no real um, reservations. Uh, so the, the next one that caught my mind was Lakini. I hope I'm pronouncing that right as well. Um, Lakini was very nice. They, they focused more on Pinot Noirs and uh, that's one of the things that caught my eye as well. Uh, just walking up to it and Pinot is just like, that's right up my alley. I love, I love a good Pinot. I love how the grape doesn't lie and, um, and really represents the region from which it comes. Um, I brought back one bottle of that and it was the uh, Chehalem. I hope I'm pronouncing that as well correctly, uh, Chalem Mountains, and we're going to be taking a look at that. 
Um, otherwise, I loved their Pinots. They had some sparkling wine. It was also fantastic. Their whites were also very nice, smooth. I found it to be smooth, buttery, um, and just all around very pleasant. Uh, so definitely check them out. Um, very gracious staff. Um, and uh, because of their more Pinot oriented uh, menu and offering, one thing that I found that I liked was you had a little less of the party crowd. Um, so that was nice because I like, I like to take my time without, you know, having uh, too many, you know, uh, folks who come out for perhaps um, other types of wine um, or less, less focused on the actual tastings. Uh, so that was nice, uh, very nicely done, nice interior, uh, very lovely boutique atmosphere. So check it out. Let me know what you think as well and what your favorites are. Um, the next one, number four on the list was Fidelitas, or as um, our host uh, would say, Fidelitas. I'm not sure how it's pronounced, um, but we'll just say Fidelitas. And uh, they had great wines that were representative as well of the region. They were super gracious to host at the last minute without any uh, reservations. So that was nice. Thank you guys, I appreciate it. Um, and they brought a lot of uh, focused materials to help understand the wines, the region at large. Um, and it, it, it felt like a really good study. Um, so for that, on those counts alone, I think um, it's well worth the visit. And the wines are the icing on the cake. Um, I loved their up to, and so that's the one bottle I opted to take back with me and it's a Bordeaux blend from Red Mountain. So if you've had any Fidelitas wines, and uh, please let me know below in the comments uh, what you think of them, what were your favorites, and, uh, and yeah, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, start that discussion. Stay tuned for uh, the review of the up to coming up in coming months, those who enter the pipeline as well. Um, now, no, wine country trip is complete without pausing for a meal. So um, I, I was at this point where I, I thought it would be a good idea to pause. And uh, together with my brother and sister-in-law, uh, we, uh, we took a pause and uh, decided to take lunch at the Bistro at Hollywood, which is just across the street. And I have to say, you know, it, it's, there's very little fanfare about this location, but the food is top notch. The food is incredible. Um, I think I had a, a short rib. I had a short rib plate. Um, my sister had a, um, I think it was a sandwich, a BLT type sandwich. And my brother had the paella and <laughs> <laughs> it was all incredible, top-notch food. This was definitely way, way beyond bistro food. Um, it paired really well with their wines, and uh, I, I cannot recommend this place enough. Um, well worth the stop. Take a leisurely stop, have a great lunch here, and then continue to explore wine. Um, after that, I visited uh, Tinte. Tinte? I hope I'm pronouncing that right as well. Tinte Cellars. Uh, they were back in the uh, co-op area across the street and uh, the, the staff were very, uh, um, very knowledgeable, very savvy of the wines. Um, it, was, it was quite nice um, and very uh, helpful as well. Um, I love it when, you know, I, I go for a tasting and, you know, the, the host um, takes the time to explain the regions, where they come from, the wines the vision behind them and, 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 and sort of give me context around the wines. So I, I really liked that a lot. Um, so that was very nice. Um, shout out to Noah, thank you so much. I appreciated all your help there. So I bent the rules a little bit. I settled for two bottles <laughs> for my carry on. Um, I went with the Viognier from Columbia Valley and I also took the William Church Syrah from Yakima Valley. I think all the wines were really well made, well put together. Um, they're made for a good tasting. Um, 
but these were my favorite of them all. I liked their expression. Um, they, they came a little bit um, forward, uh, you know, relative to what I had been seeing so far. You know, something, something interesting to keep in mind is, you know, through these tastings, I would have some of my hosts say, this is our big cab. And it was, it was sort of quaint and interesting, kind of chuckled internally um, because what was considered a big cab was probably along the lines of a big pino from Northern California. <laughs> so not, this is not a critique or anything. It was just an observation, you know? So, oh, so a lot of times when I, um, when I taste, especially in different regions such as this, I like to, I often try to take time to calibrate my palate and, and, and give context to what I'm about to taste, not just for a specific winery, but in the region at large. Um, but that was, that was an interesting observation. So keep that in mind. If you're coming from, you know, uh, Mendoza or Northern California, or somewhere else, you know, that produces these big, bold wines, or if you're used to drinking Bordeaux from France, you know, uh, or Nebbiolo from Italy, or, you know, big, you know, Super Tuscans, or Zinfandel, big peppery Zinfandels, uh, and you go do wine tasting in a region such as Woodenville, um, keep in mind that everything is going to be restrained and brought back across the board, regardless of the varietal you're having. And this has to do with the region. It has to do with the climate overall and how the grapes express themselves in those climates. They're a little less harsh, less bold, less brash. They're a little more subtle in, in their character. Um, and uh, that's nice. Um, it makes for an interesting study and a change of pace for any palate, um, and I fully embrace that. Um, now, as we're going down this list, we're going more smaller, smaller, and more artisan, as you've probably, you're probably going to notice for those of you who are familiar with these wineries. And that's not intentional, it's just the way things played out, um, which was very uh, uh, nice to me. It was actually um, a pleasant uh, turn of events. Um, after Tintisellas, uh, the next day, my day was done at that point, um, but my next day I visited Panther Creek. It was uh, referred to me by um, a lovely host at a previous, previous tasting. Um, I'd sort of articulated um, what I like to explore as well, as, as well as these other wines I like to explore. Really small batch production artisan winemakers and wineries. And, um, and so she was graceful enough, gracious enough to um, refer me to Panther Creek. And so that was nice of her, thank you. Um, and uh, it turned out to be everything I wanted. I could have wanted at that moment in time. Um, I was feeling a little more, I wanted an even more focused tasting um, because it's a bit off the side and their specialty, their offering is mostly Pinots. And um, there was, it was less crowded and their location was more for uh, club pickups and such than for hosting full tastings, at, at least uh, during these times with the pandemic. Um, but they were able to host me at the last minute. Um, and I essentially had the entire tasting room to myself with the gracious host as well. And uh, we went through, I took my time and went through the wines, a uh, beautiful little tasting room, uh, very quiet um, and just lovely overall. And the wines were beautiful. Um, it reminded me of why I obsess so much about these very, very small batch production wines. We're talking a few hundred cases, uh, production per vintage tops. Um, and Panther Creek delivered on every single one of those over and over. Um, I wanted to pick the entire lineup and take with me, but I was forced to 
I had to force myself to settle for just one. Um, and that, what I went with was the uh, Schindler Vineyard uh, Pinot um, from uh, Willamette Valley. That was a great Pinot. I'm looking forward to talking more about it, um, you know, on the blog and on Instagram and perhaps even here. Uh, but if you are in that area, I highly recommend you put Panther Creek on your list, uh, stopping by. Call them ahead, make an appointment. They can only host about one tasting at a time, maybe two. Um, but check it out. If you're into Pinots, stop by. It's right around the corner from Lakini. So you could start one and the other. You do Pinots all day. Perfect. Um, and different expressions, different styles. Um, just uh, fantastic for any Pinot wine snob out there. Um, and last but not the least was Glacier View Cellars. Um, that was um, an amazing experience. I was referred there by uh, the folks at uh, Panther Creek. Again, after explaining what it is I look for off the beaten path, I'm looking for that small winemaker, that artisan. Um, and there's a certain level um, of nuance that comes with these small batch production wines. And that's what I obsess over. I appreciate all wines, <laughs> all good, well-built wines, but there's a special place in my heart for small batch production artisan wines. And uh, so they referred me to Glacier View. This wasn't in that same area. It was a little off, maybe out a mile, mile and a half away, um, but well worth it. Tucked in the back of a commercial um, uh, building a space there. Um, it was raining, pouring at the time. Um, it was well worth the trouble getting out there. Um, this is an interesting winemaker. I think uh, you should watch for sure closely. She's been uh, making wine ever since uh, she was 15. <laughs> she told me, I asked, how long have you been making wine? And uh, since I was 15. So that's incredible. And it shows in the wines. They're well put together, clean, crisp, precise. Um, not surprised there. Uh, it's, been, it's been a recurring theme I've seen with a lot of the female winemakers that I've explored, um, uh, which is also a nice coincidence considering it's uh, Women's History Month um, now, March. So that was nice. Uh, every one of the wines, I couldn't fault any of them. They were great. Very, uh, uh, very interesting winemaker with a lot of passion and context to their wines. Um, driven a lot by her natural, her experience in nature, and and uh, um, and you know all the you notice all the wines are named after hikes. She's an avid hiker, um, and just being out in nature overall. Um, so that was kind of was a refreshing little take. Very quaint little tasting room. It was very nice. It was very special, um, and precisely why I stay off the beaten path. I think this winemaker is going to be making um, some amazing wine looking forward and she has so many amazing vintages ahead of her um, and uh, I think you should um, follow her closely as well. Um, she was able to ship, which was nice, fantastic. Uh, so I settled for the Mailbox Peak, which is a Bordeaux style blend from Red Mountain. Uh, that was one of my favorite. I've already reviewed that one recently. Um, and uh, so check the blog, check Instagram, and you'll see there. I'll put a link below as well. As I, as these wines pop up in the review pipeline or in the blog, I'll leave links below. Another one that caught my attention was the Napiqua, which was a Grenache, Syrah, Cab Franc, and Nebbiolo blend. Very interesting. I liked it. You know, one of the things blends one of the things that uh, caught my attention with this was having experienced the subtlety and nuance of this region at large, this part of the world at large, um, I wanted to see how the complexities and uh, nuances really shine through on all these grapes that have different expressions. When you're talking Grenache, Syrah, Nebbiolo, 
Cab Franc. They couldn't all be completely, you know, even any more different from each other in their expression. And uh, the Napiqua, I think, really caught me there. You get that just beautiful, subtle layering um, that you might not even find here in California with a similar blend because the grapes are just so bold. Over there, they're, they're a lot more restrained um, and really gives it a chance to shine through, you know, being from the Columbia Valley. Um, so check that out. Let me know if you have any favorites of hers. Um, leave them in the comments below and uh, I'll be sure to check them out on my next order. Um, and the last one I brought back was, um, I don't know if I can pronounce this correctly. I think it was Gruner uh, Veltliner. Um, it's a, I think it was a pet nat style. So method ancestral, ancestral method uh, type of uh, uh, wine. It still had the leaves and the sediment in there, um, which is very nice. I like the um, nuance and complexity that adds a texture. Um, I prefer that style. I don't really believe in disgorging. Um, I, I think you you miss you miss you miss the important part. Um, so uh, so what I uh, so I this is the second time I'm seeing a winemaker uh, put this style out there, an artisan winemaker. And the last one was another favorite female winemaker of mine. Um, Passaggio and uh, she has a pet nat as well which we're going to be looking at as well so be sure to follow on Instagram or on the blog or um, here as well and uh, look out for that review um, but yeah there it is wine snobs that was a weekend in Seattle so if you're ever in Seattle and wondering what to do you have a weekend to burn take a look at Woodenville and uh, if for nothing else, uh, take a look at these wineries, you'll have a very broad experience from a lot more well put together, uh, well orchestrated uh, tasting experiences, all the way to hands-on owner winemaker pouring your wines. So you'll be able to really get this broad perspective on the wine world up in that area. Um, at large. So if you have any other favorites out there that I missed, please let me know. I don't want to miss them. So you know what I like. Let me know in the comments below. Stay in touch, like, subscribe, comment, and uh, let's have fun. Cheers, wine snobs.